22 часа 28 минут. Масса. Welcome to Space Vidcast 5.19 for Saturday, December 8th, 2012. Why did you laugh at that? I'm allowed to smile. Uh, maybe. We are your hosts, Benjamin and Carrie Ann Higginbotham. We'll be your hosts for this epic episode uh, next hour or so. Um, there was some space news going on this last week. Uh, specifically, I thought, which was a fairly big deal, and I have no graphics for anything else, is that the De Department of Defense, <laughs> was that a graphic? Yeah, graphic. Is looking beyond United Launch Alliance, bleh, easy for me to say, which right now is the sole provider for launches for the DOD mm -hmm. for upcoming future launches. Now, the thing with ULA launches is that they have been getting more and more and more expensive over the past decade or so, I guess. Right. And, uh, or I get even longer. And it's get, getting to the point where it's just unreasonably high. And the Department of Defense isn't going to look outside of the U.S. for launches. We're not going to go to China to have our stuff launched. But we don't have very many options here within the U.S. You've got ULA. And until recently, that was it. Yeah. Pretty much, right? So um, the ULA said, look, if you lock into a five-year contract with us, We'll fix the pricing right here. Okay. And the DOD was like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else was like, It's sort of like uh, a phone contract where you're like, how long do I really want to have this kind phone? Kind Everyone else is kind of like, well, but what about SpaceX and Orbital and these other launch providers that are coming on at a fraction of the cost? Yeah. And quickly. So, and quickly, yeah. So, um... The DODs, but sitting there going, but um, you know, Atlas V, Delta IV, very very stable vehicles. We kind of want to fly in good stuff, but we don't want to pay the high. What do we do? What do we right. do? Right. So uh, the Air Force has recently been authorized to purchase up to fifty rocket cores over the next five years. Okay. Thirty six of them, not all fifty, will be from United Launch Alliance. So, uh, okay. So we're kind of breaking it down a little bit, going, yeah. Their stuff works. It's really good. It's really expensive, but this is important <laughs> payloads. Yeah, you have so, to have a backup plan of sorts, right? And we don't want to have this price continue to go up. So we're of going course. to, of course, lock into 36 of these flights. But the remaining launches are going to be done on a competitive basis. Now, that doesn't mean that it will not go to ULA. Right. It means that everyone has to compete to get those flights. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean just price either, right? I mean, there's got to right. be some, you know, hey, Higginbaugh from Rocket Company can't go, we'll compete! Because DOD's going to go, how about no? So there's there's a level of, um, you know, you have to have some stability in your platform. Right. But, you know, as SpaceX ramps up, you know, they've had um, four launches of the Falcon 9, and all of those missions have been successful. The primary payloads have been successful on those right. 
uh, missions that have had engine out and still maintain mission success. Just don't mention the second. But that well, but that happens in other rockets too, and we'll talk yeah, about that no, a little bit does. later on. Um, so uh, the first of these awards is going to happen in 2015, mm -hmm. with the launch to happen in 2017. So the interesting part about this is that for the first time in a very very long time, mm -hmm. uh, the really um, what am I trying to say? Lucrative contracts right. from the Department of Defense because they launch a lot of stuff. Yeah, Department fifty launches over five years, ten launches a year. Department that's a lot. of Defense. Yeah, that's nothing to sneeze at. That's, that's one customer. That's just the Air Force. Fifty launches, five years, ten launches a year on average. Right. Uh, that's a lot of stuff. So those are pretty lucrative. Those are contracts you want to have for your uh, enhanced expendable launch vehicle program (EELV). Uh, so yeah, that's a, I think that's actually one of those things that could start shaking up the industry a little bit because that allows money to flow into other sectors. And um, as we'll talk about a little bit later on uh, with the Golden Spike Company, that's going to be our main topic, uh, money's kind of an important thing. Well, and also around the country, not like in one specific spot. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like sometimes you get, you when you go with a certain provider, they're based in a certain area, and so the money gets filtrated into that that's true, except remember United Launch Alliance is a conglomerate, essentially, of Lockheed Martin and Boeing Aerospace. So ah, yes. uh, they're not, I mean, yeah, they're, I suppose. they are ULA, but they're like splattered all over the country. Whereas a company like SpaceX, they're basically in Hawthorne with a teeny tiny little bitty bitty bit in Texas, Cape, and Vandenberg. That's it. That's it. So, um, next story. <laughs> This one bothers me the way that you worded it. Why? Because it's not... It is and it isn't. Curiosity's rover twin announced, so I put two kittens that were twins because they're curious. Because cats are cur... Oh, fine. Fine. No, no. It's all good. Curiosity killed the cat. <laughs> Whatever. I'm deeply offended Whatever. by that. <laughs> maybe, maybe the second one won't survive entry, descent, and landing. So, um, That's terrible. I'm calling it the twin because it's going to be made of Curiosity spare parts and systems. Basically, NASA is going to launch a mimic mission, a similar mission to Curiosity. It's similar. I, I just I don't like that it's called Different Curiosity's so rover twin because it's it's not a twin, and Curiosity is well, its own rover, and it is own, deserves its own glory, and it won't be, this one won't be Curiosity 2. It's not like we had Vostok 1, Vostok 2. This is going to be Curiosity, much, and then the other one is yet to be named. Much like a human twin, they're not exactly the same. They're just, you know, fundamentally they're going to look really similar to each other. So that's why I called it a twin. So anyhow, they're going to look very similar based uh, off of Curiosity's spare parts, but the scientific payload will be different. And some of the cool things they're talking about are first, they're asking the scientific community, what do you guys want to see? But second, right. they're saying, look, we think we should prepare to have a return mission. So while Curiosity 2, or whatever we want to call it, itself won't be able to actually return samples back to Earth, right. it could store stuff in a future mission, could go down, grab it, and then return that back to Earth, so we could have a Mars return mission. So it could be put into a cooler? Something like that. And then someone will come by and grab the cooler? Grab the cooler and yank, and hopefully a human will come and drop down, put it on a vehicle and send it back up, be like, yeah, no, here you go, there's the stuff you wanted. We <laughs> FedEx overnight. We from Curiosity too. <laughs> uh, so, um, Good Lord. Uh, this has a budget of $1.5 billion over the next few years right. leading up to launch. Right. Um, now, a lot of people are saying, yeah, but the original Curiosity was around that same budget, and it It was, went way over budget. It's 2. It took 5 way too long. Billion. The thing is, because <sighs> they are basing it off of old Curiosity's kind of infrastructure... Yeah, they're not starting from square one. I they're think, not starting from... I think from... they know their, uh, what it's going to cost now. They already have the EDL part of it worked out. There was a lot of delay in... Um, some of the motors they were using, and that's right. not longer, no longer going to be an issue. So, um, Curiosity Rover Twin scheduled sometime in 2020. Uh, the Atlas V is now cleared to launch the X. Th there we go. The 37B. X37B, the next uh, spy space. It looks like this next spy space plane. Uh, the reason it was kind of on hold is that it uses the Pratt Whitney, Pratt and Whitney Rocketdyne RL10 engine or variation of it mm -hmm. uh, for its upper stage and mm -hmm. recently there was an issue with this um, I tried to grab video of it but I couldn't find anything that was you know compelling 
Um, but basically, there was a Delta IV launch. Okay. Uh, it went up, and the second stage uses this very similar uh, variation. It uses the RL-10B-2 variation, and uh, the Atlas Centaur upper stage uses the RL-10A-4-2. Important numbers. Oh no, that one. Yeah, oh, yeah, that one exactly. But slightly different variations of right. them. Right. But on the Delta IV launch, um, it they didn't weren't getting the performance out of it that they wanted. Okay. Um, and so it had to burn extra long for the mission to be successful. Okay. And you're looking at that going, well, that's not supposed to happen. What went on? Right. The current theory is there was a fuel leak. So they've been taking extra care on the engine this time. Uh. Again, it's a slightly different variation. Um, is it I mean, like a Curiosity twin? It's like a it's like a curious it's the RL10 twin exactly. So they're taking extra care and uh, they should be launching the X37B uh, I believe uh, this coming this week. I think that's in our launch calendar coming up. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so and that's the super secret spy plane. Uh, we don't actually know what it does and I got a little bit of guff about that because we talked about China's spy plane in last week's show. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in comments when people were like I don't understand what you're talking about. So, uh, Which yeah. we get a lot, by the way. Well, no, because we don't really know what the X-37B's true mission is. Right. We know that it can go up for like a year. Um, it's kind of like a space shuttle. It's a miniature, well, here. It's a miniature space shuttle, but it's not, it doesn't have any place for humans. It, go up, it goes up for over a year, or less than a year? It's something, it's right around that time. I want to say it's 200 days, not over 365. Right, right, right. Um, or maybe 100 days. But you know, we'll say half a year, two years, somewhere in there. It can go up for a long time. It's really got solar panels, time. keep it going. It can change its orbit. We know that because uh, it, it did that. Um, but then, you know, what's its goal? What's it doing? It's got a little payload in the back there that's about the size of a uh, flatbed truck. So it can bring stuff up. What? We don't know. Cheese. Cheese, yeah. So we know that it's a super secret spy plane, but... It's super secret, so we don't know actually what it actually does. So it's like the best kept, worst kept secret plane ever, <laughs> I guess. That's really terrible. We also we totally know about it, but we don't know anything about it. We also had a launch event. Oh, wow. This is of a communication satellite uh, for basically for Russia, but for other stuff. It was launched on a Proton M, and being that we're a space show, here you go. And it is supposed to start over black. I shouldn't, but it does. Yeah. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And we have ignition start. We have liftoff of an ILS Proton rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan with the Yamal 402 satellite on board. It can be a little difficult to see, especially with the overcast, but at about 10 seconds after liftoff, the rocket does a rollover maneuver and will soon experience maximum dynamic pressure, also known as max Q, and is the maximum aerodynamic load on the vehicle. For Proton, it corresponds to about Mach 1.6 and occurs at one minute, two seconds after liftoff. So there you have it, uh, just a quick, I, I love how they didn't light the vehicle. So it's just like pitch black. And my other favorite part, I always love it when PAO does this, which is one, zero. Lift off. <laughs> well, particularly when you can't see the darn thing, I, what are you supposed to do? I know. Uh, so our chat room actually did bring out uh, the last story we talking about the X-37B. Uh, OTV-1, which was the first one, was 224 days, which is why I was like, I don't think it's over a year. But then OTV-2 was 469 days, which is why I also was like, but I thought it was over a year. So there you go. It was both not a year and over a year at the Man, same time. Man, those twins. <laughs> Just getting in all kinds never, of trouble. Never ending. All right, let's take a quick <laughs> break. When we come back, huge announcement this last week. Golden Spike Company, right? Yeah. Yeah. What? I think it's a... You don't... Okay. We're going to discuss the Golden Spike Company when we come back. Done. We choose to go to the 
Business is sending a spaceship to the International Space Station. This rocket lifted off early this morning. A small step for space travel, one giant leap for privately owned commercial enterprise. It could change space travel forever, forever, forever. Welcome back. And in that break, you saw the Golden Spike Company kind of teaser trailer, as it were, uh, that they uh, showed at their press conference uh, last week, uh, December 6th, I believe, was the announcement. Um, and we've been hearing, hearing murmurings of uh, this company for a little while now. Um, actually, I th the first I saw of it was on nasaspaceflight.com. There's a little bit of an article. And in their L2 section, which I absolutely love, if you're not an L2 member, you should seriously consider getting um, L2 if, if you're not already. I'll say once again if you're not. And, um, well, I was being super redundant. Uh, and uh, I just got really interested. I was so interested, in fact, that on the Space Frontier Advocates uh, discussion board, I started sending out stuff going, hey, look at this. What do you guys think of this? And what it is, what it turns out to be, because beforehand it was all speculation, is a group of really impressive people. Do you have the list of people? Can you call up? I can grab it. Um, it's a long, long list of people very impressive names, not small names by any means, uh, who are looking to send humans back to the moon. They're going to do it completely privately. So this isn't a government venture at all. It will cost $1.4 um, billion to fly two or more people to the moon. So that's going to be about $750 million per ticket or so. And it kind of, um, yeah, I, it, they didn't, I don't think they mentioned if it could be more, so you might be able to drop that ticket down more if you get another person. The thing is, that price is too high, I think, for uh, billionaires. Now, there are some questions in the chat room, like how big of a rocket are they going to use? So, as I understand it, they're using U.S. rockets in existing or technology that's already out there or like about to come out. Um, so, they, I believe they mentioned uh, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rockets. Heavy for sure, and I think uh, Delta, I thought, but I could be wrong. United Launch Alliance for that. I know they did mention ULA as well. They also mentioned companies like Mass and Space Sim Systems and Armadillo Aerospace for developing the lunar lander technology mm -hmm. to make all of that go. Uh, so rock, rock on for those companies, right? I mean, those are, um, yeah. ex if you go back, those were uh, Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge contestants yeah. uh, looking to do exactly that kind of thing. So yet another place where the X Prize. Uh, challenge kind of uh, helped revolutionize the industries. Uh, so, um, yeah, so it's an interesting venture, um, interesting idea, and uh, go ahead, name some of the board members. Uh, so, board members include, among others, uh, Alan Stern, uh, Esther Dyson, James French, Jug Doug Griffith, um, Max Voss Vossoff, I cannot ever pronounce his name. Um, but then they also have other people like Andy Chaikin, Jeff Greeson, um, Bobby Block, Newt Gingrich, Homer Hickam. I mean, you know, Bill Richardson, not names that are unfamiliar to people inside of the space industry sure. or, you know, people who are just fans of the uh, new space industry as a whole. So my only thing is names are awesome, right? I mean, th that is an impressive list. That's, not, that's just a fraction of it, too. That is a very impressive list right. of people who have a history of getting things done. Right. But um, New Space, which I'm going to categorize this as New Space, um, also has a history of having bold ideas and no funding. So my concern is where's the funding going to go? Certainly $1.4 billion to fly to the moon, but you still need initial capital to get to that point to right. buy the tickets and the, and pay people salaries right. uh, take care of some of the studies you need to have that money in place um, before you can fly to the moon so my question which i don't think has truly been answered yet is where does that money come from um, i've heard people say okay well we'll use the money for pre-sales to make that all go um, but 
Will they get enough pre-sales? Yeah, but again, this isn't um, space tourism. This isn't Virgin Galactic. We're not just trying to get people to do fancy, fun things. This isn't a wedding in space. This is mainly for other governments for scientific exploration of the moon, mm. um, which is, I think, it's a little bit different take on the whole new space frontier, if you will. Yeah, because new we're space... Not we going up, we're not going up. We're not planetary resources. We're yeah. not trying to go up. We're not trying to mine anything. Um, and again, we're not doing space tours of of look at the pretty earth and isn't that awesome. This is like, no, 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 we mean business. And not just business for us, but business for other governments. People who maybe can't get up there on and their own. And corporations. So if a corporation wants to do some yeah, sort absolutely. of study. Um, you know, but that's still a really, you know, we're going to call that a billion dollars for a corporation. So a company like Apple, mm -hmm. um, not that big of a deal. But for other corporations, yeah. Well, big deal for any, a billion dollar ticket. That's... It's, that's a big deal for any company. Well, and the other the other thing to sort of think about, um, if you will, is that right now, because they've said, hey, we have this plan, mm -hmm. okay? We didn't build a 50-story building in secret. We have a really good plan to build a 50-story building. In public. Right, and those are two completely different things. That isn't like, hey guys, we totally been to the moon. Look at all my pictures. This is like, we want to do this. This is something that we're working towards. This is, we believe we have the architecture in place in order to do it. Or maybe we'll not, soon. Right, maybe not right this very moment, not this very day, but very, very soon. Um, you know, it, it doesn't take a genius to, to put all these different puzzle pieces together. I think the chat room's making an assumption that may not be true, which is okay. they need a really, really big rocket. So we mentioned Falcon Heavy. Um, and then, then we said ULA, which may be Delta, and someone corrected saying, well, no, if it's Falcon Heavy, it's going to have to be Atlas. But no, it doesn't. Right. Uh, who said that this all is going on one launch? Well, so well, maybe people go up on one launch. Something else, like fuel or a fuel depot, goes up on another launch. Something else goes up on a third launch. I mean, there's actually, no reason this has to go up on just one. Right. We do not have to do this Apollo style. Right. And No one said this is Apollo style. And they've even said that for sure, that this is going to, it's going to be in multiple launches. Not 12 launches, like... Three. Mm -hmm. But that's a significantly different thing than just one sure. Apollo style, as you Because then say. you need a Saturn-class rocket, and those those are, A, not built anymore, and B, very expensive. Yeah, the only thing is that, uh, it, and I, I understand that they are a, a, a rocket company, if you will, or they are a, a... They're the engineers behind all of it, and not everyone makes pretty videos, but if you've been sitting on this for two and a half years, and that's the video you came out with, like... <laughs> I, I, okay, so you don't like the video. I, well, I kind of agree. As someone else said, like, sexy doesn't sell unless you're the porn industry. Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't do anything. I watched that video and went, and? <laughs> what now? I love the debate that's going on in the chat room. By the way, we want your comments as well. Um, what do you think of Golden Spike Company? Is this, is this, I, I remain hopeful, right? So, um... I don't see any downside to this. I, I, I only see upside potential. The worst thing that could happen is that they don't get funding, uh, they can't maintain, and they're not able to do it, and then someone else was inspired by it, and maybe they can figure out the money. Right. Right. There's, I just don't see a huge downside to it. But the upside here, the upside is astronomical. Yeah. Huh. Pun intended. <laughs> uh, the upside is putting humans back on the moon, potentially not even in a flag and footprints sort of way. Although, right. for, to start, we're talking flag and footprints here. But basically, yeah. we're talking about putting mere mortals on the moon, not NASA astronauts, potentially. I guess, I, I guess the, the other sort of downside could possibly be like, all right, say they do it. Yep. Say they do it, right? So they help Brazil get up, they help China get up, and they help Somalia get up. And then what? Like, who wants to be, like, the eighth guy who hit the moon? But you, well, that's just it. It's, it's not just a prestige thing at this point. Now you can start conducting real science. Now you can start looking at what it would take to put a lunar colony on the moon. By the way, someone earlier said uh, we should go. Like, someone will pay our tickets to go. Um, I have always wanted to do this show in this format live from the moon with people asking questions in real time. Somehow positioned in such a way that we could have Earthrise in the background. Right? That is... Absolutely something I want to do. I have never wavered on that. I think that would be awesome. Yeah, the it's only far reason we would say no moon. is if only one of us could go at a time. Um, yes, he would. Because I'd kill him. Hmm, no. 
So, uh, Black, Black Projects mentions time delay would be killer. Uh, much easier on the moon than it would be on, uh, say, Mars. And we already have a multi-second delay uh, with our live streaming. So I don't think it would be that much different than what we're doing today from a delay standpoint. Uh, now, Mars, on the other hand, that would be a problem. Yeah, that would be it. Uh, so, yeah, that's what that's what they're looking to do. I don't see a huge downside to what they're looking to do. I only see upside, and I wish them the best of success. I do hope that they're able to do something... Um, Frankly, I think it's inspiring, um, but I want them, I would love to see where the money is at. Because at the end of the day, it is the cold, harsh reality of it is, if you can't afford it, you can't do it. Yeah. So everything else, everything else looks good to me. Um, well, let me reword that. They haven't really announced everything else, but with the people that they have announced um, and kind of extrapolating from that, I can see where they would be able to do this. I suppose. It just, it, something in the back of my head is screaming like, I don't know how many people have seen the, the original Pirates of the Caribbean movie where Jack, Captain Jack Sparrow was like, but I have a compass. Ah! Like, <laughs> that's how this feels. I'm like, no, 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 I totally have this plan. It's, it's all right. No biggie. I got this compass that doesn't point north. <laughs> and everyone's just like, yeah, but all right. Captain let's Jack do that. Sparrow did, he knew something that no one else knew, didn't he? I'm just saying. I just think he was savvy. That's how, it, that's how it feels in my head. I saw that look. <laughs> that look you gave me was like, really? <laughs> all right, we'd love to know what you think. Leave your comments on. Actually, we have a new comment system on Space Fig Cast. A few of you have been using it, and it is awesome. So I'd love to get your comments on spacefigcast.com. Just go into the episode, say what you want to say. And because it's discus based, you get email notifications notifications when other people comment on your stuff so you can have an actual thread going on um you can get uh comments you, it's, you can immediately know when someone calls you stupid <laughs> exactly it's kind of nice uh, you you can call me stupid then through your comments and you it works that. with any other disk space site so you can actually have all your comments for all your different stuff in one kind of centralized location and while we do appreciate your comments on youtube and all of our other social media as well i'd really love to focus our stuff on space vidcast if we can so go to spacefidcast.com. Now, if you don't want to, that's totally cool. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, all that fun stuff. We'll leave all those, those in the show notes. But uh, yeah, that's, that's where we'd love to get your comments is right there on Space Feedcast. By the way, that is also the fastest way to get the show. If we ever have a delay on YouTube, if there's anything else holding up the show, you're going to get it first on spacefeedcast.com. You're also going to get the extra fe features like After Dark, uh, the epic ad-free version, um, and then, of course, the cool comments. And we answer our comments there first uh, by days and days in advance. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly. So there are many reasons to use spacefeedcast.com as opposed to the other media outlets. But, of course, we're not going to prevent you from using the other ones. Feel free to use whatever you'd like. And on that note, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to uh, talk about your comments from last week's show. And uh, how many people called me stupid, which is a re recurring theme week after week. Uh, so stay with us. It is us. your middle name. It is my middle name. We'll be right back. Look into her face, determination in her eyes. She won't give up a quick or fall for little fashion lies. Films on some expectation. This girl's a fascination. And welcome back. So last week we talked about uh, what China's deal was. <laughs> What's up with China? You sound like Seinfeld. What's the deal with China? Uh, a little bit. Okay. Uh, talking about um, a terrible impression. Uh, the general theme was um, they were stealing information from JAXA. We right. wanted to know why. So that's kind of the general theme of most of our comments, but not all of them. Uh, the first one comes from Bill Hughesley. Housley? Uh, Housley, something like that. Um, who commented on spacefigcast.com. So thank you very much, Bill. We appreciate that. He said, Ben, in one breath you said that we want space motivations that are more personal, and then in the very next breath you downplay spinoffs again. Make up your mind. See, uh, the funny thing is, Bill, Ben does not see those two as being diametrically opposing comments. They're not. So here's the thing. Let, let me... Let me clarify this. You and I do. No. Let, but he doesn't. I, I have, hang on, let me clarify how this, mm, how, yeah. here's how this works in my Please brain. Please clarify. All right, should we launch a mission to put a 500 
mile rod into space? No. No, really. Seriously, consider this. Should we put a 500 mile rod in space? It has no reason to exist. It will not do science. It will not do any earth observing. It won't do anything. It is just a 500 mile rod. It is a round tube we're going to put into space. And we're going to do this because the spin-off technology we get from this will be amazing. Okay, the thing about spin-off technologies is you don't necessarily know what kind of technologies are going to spin off of the things that you're already developing. Look, I'm not anti-spin-off technology. What I'm saying is using it as a reason to launch a mission is wrong. Spin-off technology is fine, but you shouldn't use it as the fundamental fact to put a 500-mile rod in space. Instead, what you should do is say, look, we're going to build this really complicated thing and put it in space. And out of that program is spin-off technology, but that really complicated thing needs to have a mission that stands on its own without saying you need spin-off technology to justify it. You're putting the That's cart before the horse. No, you are. You are. You, you are. You are. <laughs> if you are choosing to use spin-off technology as a way to justify the mission, you have failed immediately. Without ever making the mission go, that mission is a failure. You need to make sure that that mission is justifiable on its own. And whatever, whatever spin-off technology we get from it, which I am all for spin-off technology, whatever we get from it is just gravy. That is what I think about spin-off technology. There you go. I think that's all clear. All right. Uh, Hel Helios Works AV says, I agree, China is definitely not the only nation doing this, and there are political reasons why they are always in the news and portrayed as in this light for doing it. Obviously, other nations are invading databases, snooping, wiretapping, flying drones, satellite over other people's countries, etc., etc. The U.S. is, quote, open, unquote, as far as they always... I'm sorry. As far as they've always a... Com that reads funny. As they always have a complete story to tell, but not necessarily one that is true. It's a clever tactic, but not honestly, quote-unquote, open. Do we honestly know what the X-37 is for? No, we don't. Actually, we, we have no clue what it's for. We know that it's there. We know that it flies. We can track it. But we have no idea what it's in this payload bay. We don't know... It could be irradiating us. It could be doing nothing. It could be, that, that's another potential. It could be just an empty doing space plane nothing. that flies around doing nothing just to mess with China. It, yeah, sort of like, um, you know, sometimes a, a really uh, exciting product is coming out, uh, like the latest iPhone or uh, the hottest new movie is coming out. And certain things kind of leak out to the press. Mm -hmm. And there's always the, well, of course, because we let that leak because we wanted to see who, well, who mm -hmm. has loose lips, essentially. Sure. So, sure, why not? Why not fly a completely empty plane that's doing jack nothing just to freak some people out? I know, it seems to work in China. I think it's brilliant. Oh, I'm, or maybe there's something on board. We have no idea. So a uh, point well taken, right? Um, you know, we're, we're not as innocent as we make ourselves out to be. We always feel like we're in the right because it's us, right? In my country, I have to be right. Um, but maybe we're not. I don't know. Um, I have no idea what's on the X-37B. Maybe it is a horrible, horrible vehicle. Maybe it is a nothing. On the other hand, just to reiterate a little bit of what we were saying last week, a little dirty and undermined that China's doing that sort of... Yeah, that seems that does seem different, right? The X-37B, they're like, here's a space plane! We're not going to tell you what it does! Whereas China's like, we're going to steal your information. We're just stealing it. We're just taking it for ourselves. That, that's different. I mean, that, that's just it's, straight it's out different. It's a slightly different thing. They didn't even they, they didn't even admit it to it. They just, they're like, oh, we're just going to steal it. I, <laughs> Hope I don't get caught. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm, they got caught. A little All different. Right. Uh, China's game is economic. Currently, they are a factory of the West, but the real wealth is in being with technology innovators owning the IP rights. A space program is a focus for development and marketing prestige. Symbols that came from Mutliang. <laughs> M that guy. Yeah, that guy it came from Mutliang. Uh, the the uh, the idea being. Um, China wants to graduate from just being factory workers to developing IP and actually having the brains behind these things. So they no longer rely on the West. They could become huge at that point, right? I mean, if they're the ones developing the next iPhone, as it were, um, and developing the next wave of technology that people want to buy, um, that's a big deal. And I wonder if, and this steps outside of the realm of space, if you watched uh, Tim Cook's, the CEO of Apple, 
uh, interview with Brian Williams on 30 Rock Center, he talked about how they're pulling more and more manufacturing back to the U.S. and one of the next Max lines, Macintosh lines next year will be manufactured here in the U.S. Right. I wonder if that's part of it. It's a, look, we're not going to give you access to our stuff anymore because you can just reverse engineer it. So, no. We're going to do this all in-house now. And again, I will restate, China's got enough people. I don't know why they don't just do all this stuff on their own. Yeah. I, I don't feel like they need us at all. I know everyone keeps saying, well, there's there's this huge reliance, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I, I it, sure, it's there. It must be there. Their, their I, I can't dispute I don't that. know. Their technology is way behind And yet at the same time, ours. it feels like you have enough people. It's not like all of the intelligence just got dumped into one country. Yeah. That stuff gets spread around. I, I, yeah, they're just, they're nowhere, from a space standpoint, they're nowhere near us. I mean, not even close. Um, from a technology standpoint, they can manufacture it, but I'm not sure they can design it to the level that we do. So if you don't know how to make, I mean, you can, you can make the instructions someone else gave you. Cooking analogy. You can read the recipe and make a recipe someone else gave you, but mm -hmm. you can't make your own recipes. Doesn't mean I can't learn. You can learn, and that's what they're doing. And that's why I think we're pulling some of our stuff back right. in house. But they haven't mastered the skill yet, is right. I think the point. How is that for an analogy? All right. Two yeah. points you for stealing from a television show. I stole from a television? All right. You did. I heard that most of these shuttles' launch cost comes from the price of the external tank, which aren't reused or repurposed. Can anyone confirm this? This comes from Ethan Muno. Um, I can absolutely confirm that this is incorrect. Uh, most of the cost of the space shuttle came from the massively huge army of people it took to maintain that vehicle. The fallacy of the entire statement is calling it reusable. It was not a reusable vehicle. We People like to say that word reusable with the space shuttle. Wrong word. It was refurbishable. So every time they launched, they would land, take the engines off, disassemble the engines, check every part, and put the engines back together. Every time it launched, they would do this. Your car is reusable. A plane is reusable. The shuttle, refurbishable at, at best. best. So, yeah, a lot of that cost was just simply going in, checking every single pile on the heat shield after every single launch. Now, granted, a lot of that, I mean, there's, there's reasons for that. I mean, you want to go in and make sure all of those tiles are okay. We saw what happened when there's a significant damage to tiles. Yes. However, um, that's an engineering flaw. It is an engineering flaw, but I'm just saying that once you already have the product done as such, you don't want to be like, eh, you know what? The last 125 times it was okay. No biggie. We'll just skip it this time. That's exactly what you want to do like an airplane. You want... You want to do it like that because you hopefully it's been engineered in such a manner like an airplane in that it would work that way. But it was not. And it as was, such, it required armies of people. Armies of people. Um, and so the people were the largest expense of the space shuttle. The uh, external tank was a small, 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 small percentage of all of that. Um, and in fact, um, a lot of expendable rockets are just less expensive than the space shuttle simply because they don't have to be refurbished and we do dump them in the ocean. Now, SpaceX, uh, as Elon Musk has said, is looking to do a reusable version of their Falcon rocket. Uh, they're testing, if you go to YouTube right now and search for SpaceX Grasshopper, you'll see tests where they actually launch a rocket, kind of hover it, and then let it drop back down. And they've got a couple different tests where they go higher and higher. Uh, SpaceX's concept is, look, we want a reusable rocket. Not a refurbishable one, a reusable one, where you go in, you fuel it back up just like an airliner, and you relaunch the thing. Uh, so if we can get to that level in spaceflight, another great vehicle that could potentially do that, Skylon. That's why I'm so excited about Skylon. Not only is it a reusable rocket like an airplane, uh, it's re and it's also single stage to orbit, which means it doesn't come apart in pieces. One giant space plane to low Earth orbit, and one giant space plane comes back. That could be a game changer for sure. Yeah, so that, that technology is still a little ways out. But those are technologies that could change the game. Unfortunately, the space shuttle, external tank, yeah, nothing, so uh, uh, nothing to do. Oh, you know what? Um, I screwed that up, so okay. stall for just a moment. Okay, I could just read the next one if you want. Uh, yeah, start reading it. Oh, did you get the, uh, the thing for it, by the I way? I did, that's why I want to do it. Okay, so 
we have been talking about how there was only a couple more shows until the end of the world. Uh, the Mayan apocalypse, whatever, calendar running out, all of that kind of thing. And we got a witty, witty comment by Dutch Universe on YouTube. The only problem, so the only thing happening on December 21st is that Gangnam Style will reach 1 billion views. <laughs> the only problem is, um, I'd, like to, I'd like you to read the first part here. Okay. Uh, so this looks like a, a quote from Nostradamus, uh, 1503. He says, uh, from the calm morning, the end will come, when of the dancing horse, the number of circles will be nine. That's hmm. the worst poem I've ever heard. Well, here's the thing, though. Yeah. Korea means calm morning country, right? Oh, okay. Gangnam Style, he's the dancing horse. Oh, all right. And on December 12th, he could have one billion views on his video, which is, by the way, nine zeros, nine circles. Right there. So it is completely possible. It is completely possible that Gangnam Style is the undoing of civilization as we know it. Dear God, we're all going to die. <laughs> on the, wait, by the way, it's not 12th? Or 21st. I see how you do that. Yeah, but whoever made this graphic yeah. did 21th. <laughs> 21th. On, on December, December the 21th. 21th. <laughs> just, so just there so you go. Know. We thought you guys would like that. We saw that, and uh, that was awesome. And yes, <laughs> December the 21th is now a Space Vidcast thing. You yeah, may use it so. freely. Thank you, Dutch Universe, for, for <laughs> pointing that out. Now we all know it's true. But unfortunately, Gangnam Style, end of civilization as we know it. Finally, from Billy Shears on YouTube, it would be nice if you could get back to the studio look with the TV screens again. No you know, kidding, Billy. <laughs> if you want to pay for that, I'm all for it. Anyway, the format you have now needs Ben in a smoker's jacket and Carrie in PJs or maybe in for After Dark. Something. Uh, yeah, you know, we totally agree. Um, it, it, as Carrie Ann said, it is all about money. When we moved out to California um, for a new job for me, uh, we had to lose the amazing studio we were in, which was the Crow Coffee Company. It's funny that studio doesn't just pack up like a building. You can't just move put it with a suitcase. us. The studio did not move with us. Oh, I well. miss Caffeinated. It was I nice do. because Caffeinated, um, who owned the uh, coffee shop, uh, he gave us some room in the back of the Crow River Coffee Company to do the show live every week. Um, he also gave us room for a C band satellite dish and. Uh, most importantly, outside of him being an awesome guy, he also technical directed and directed the show, which meant we could just host and we didn't have to worry about you know me pressing all the buttons and doing stuff. Um, all of that is gone. It, it, we, it went away when we came out here to California. Um, I would love to get it back, but it really truly does come down to money. And the best way for us to get that back is for you guys to sign up to Space Vidcast Epic. You see what I did there? Nice uh, Space segue. Vidcast, I know. Space Vidcast Epic is a great way to help support the show. It starts at about $10 per month, but in exchange, you get extra cool stuff. Other than being extra cool yourself for helping the show, uh, you also get access to exclusive content available nowhere else. For example, we're about to do a show called After Dark, which is the show after the show and is uh, rated PG. You know what? what? Just for you, want. Billy, I'll put on my PJs. Okay. Uh, so that is something that would happen in After Dark. In addition, you also get exclusive content when we do some of these AIAA meetings, LA Space Salons. Um, we give away for free the part right up to the Q&A section, which is usually, usually around 20 minutes. Everything after that, you must be an Epic subscriber to view, and that's the Q&A session. However, the Q&A session, usually the most interesting part, because that's when people start poking and prodding at other uh, people. So that, um, yeah, that's what, if you want to get access to gigs and gigs and gigs of content. Space Vidcast Epic is where you do it. Um, as Chris Radcliffe just wrote in the chat room, Space Vidcast Epic, quote, or I'm sorry, colon, it's worth it, trademark. It would have been way better if I didn't stumble over it. <laughs> yeah, it would have. It would have been oh, well. way better. All right, on that note, uh, oh, so spacefitcast.com slash epic. On that note, um, uh, holiday season is upon us, so our show schedule will be a little bit awkward. Follow us on Twitter, spacefitcast.com. No, twitter.com slash space video. We're just ending the show. All right, on that note, you guys have a great week. <laughs> ah, I, I can't even end the show correctly. I noticed. Yeah. <laughs>